And I think there was a lot of leaders who didn't know, uh, made potentially bad choices, but they did it in a way that was what mattered the most. And I, so I wanted the opportunity to say, well, just, you know, come out and say it. And if no one else does, I'm saying it to you. I know what you did. I know how hard it's been. Don't judge yourself just on the results. Just judge yourself on the fact that you were there um, and you made the decision when it mattered because there's nothing worse than not making decisions in times of crisis. Hi, I'm Renata Bernardi, and this is the Job Hunting Podcast, where I interview experts and professionals and discuss issues that are important for job hunters and those who are working to advance their careers. So make sure that you subscribe and follow, and let's dive right in. I have just interviewed Nicholas Georges, the CEO of Coco Black, an Australian premium chocolate brand. When Nick was made CEO of Coco Black, I remember seeing that on LinkedIn and thinking how exciting it must be. It's a dream come true. He's Willy Wonka now. So when a few months ago he posted again on LinkedIn and it was an open letter to CEOs talking about the challenges of leadership during the times of COVID, I decided it was a great opportunity to reach out to Nick and invite him for a chat on this podcast. Nick is originally from France and he has a background in agricultural technology, started his career at Nestle in Europe and Nestle then sent him out as an expat to other countries. He landed here in Australia and decided it was a great place for him to stay. So after 15 years uh, at Nestle, he ventured out and had several interesting job opportunities, most of them in food technology, and is now in this amazing role at Coco Black. We worked together when he was the head of food technology at Monash University, and I was the director of enterprise at Monash, and we were part of the same portfolio. And I remember we really connected back then and had very similar ideas and we were always kind of ganging up. <laughs> I, that's what I felt that, you know, I, I used to take his side um, almost every time. So I always felt uh, that there was a connection there, even though we never worked very closely together. And I think that comes through in this um, interview. I was so excited to have him here. It's the first time that the podcast has a CEO and somebody currently going through the pandemic as a leader who is managing teams and a workforce and factories and a business. And I think that that will be very interesting for us to um, be a fly on the wall and see what that looks like. Nick also is very generous and gives us tips and advice and his ideas on how job hunting would look like for him if he was out of work at this time. He gives us an insight on what leadership is going to look like um, in the new normal ahead of us um, and the sorts of challenges that are keeping him awake at night um, and things that are, you know, top of his mind at the moment in managing his teams and projects. I hope that you enjoyed this podcast. As always, it was a great pleasure for me to do it, especially because <laughs> I ordered a very large box from Coco Black to accompany the Nick podcast interview. Unfortunately, I ate most of it before um, we caught up, but I did have a hot chocolate while we were talking earlier today. Have fun, enjoy, and if there's anything that I can do to support you in your career advancement, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. In the episode show notes, you will find all of the links to get in touch with me, to follow me on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, Facebook, join my Facebook group, and also um, check out my services and see if there's anything there that you could invest in to speed up the job hunting process for you. Without further ado, here is Nick George's for you. <laughs> yeah. Hello, my friend. How are you doing? How are you? How have you been? Oh, I've been well. I've been, I've been, I've been okay. I mean, you know, 
all things considering what can i say That's how is true. your family do you have family in france how are they coping yes 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 they're all going well obviously mm -hmm. they're in on the at there and now they're um out of lockdown so obviously quite happy with that um mm -hmm. but yeah no one no one had any problem during the period or or any any issues they just had obviously the same consideration that we have but uh yeah at least nothing okay nothing um uh, damaging or, or anything everybody's doing quite well excellent i was worried for a time because i do have two brothers uh and their families who live in strasbourg so which was where the the worst of the yeah, initial wave in france was on yeah. the east of france um but yeah they had no particular problem so can't complain no you know, and, can't and complain. we well we were talking about we will very soon get to the complaining part <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> that's why I, i reached out to you but um well when you when you took up your new role i was so happy for you because i i you know we live vicariously through others right <laughs> and i love chocolate <laughs> i was like what he's going to work at coco black i can't believe it it sounded <laughs> something like you were going to be uh willy wonka or something yes yes there's a bit of that <laughs> and yeah. here i am drinking your hot chocolate look at me oh ordered, nice work i ordered the box i was very impressed it arrived the very next day yes with my hot chocolate which is delicious it's uh, the dark dark chocolate one and the coffee cheddar beans ah yes love them And it's one of our top sellers actually people really like it because um and we use um i believe we use santali coffee in it oh so we're using melbourne you know uh, melbourne coffee melbourne as well uh, yes and i ordered a couple of other things that already are gone they're gone yeah it's like in my family you know by the time i bring them home it's gone it's the gone. next day so yeah. And in your your home are you working from home these days? Just uh no just today normally I'm at work. Um you know essentially it's one of those things where I do encourage most of my staff to stay at home unless they really have to come to the office but we have a factory. Uh -huh. And I'm asking a lot of the factory guys to be there so uh, ultimately you know you need to show your face. Um yeah, it's yeah. it's not just good enough for them, right? Yeah. So um and then we have the stalls as well so Uh yeah I think I, I actually think I've only worked maybe since March maybe uh, five to ten days from home Really wow. Yes okay. so but yeah so I've been in there most most of the time you know So that's what it means to be a CEO in time Correct. of covid In time of crisis you got to yeah. show your face you got to be there uh and I think even in terms of um So you know there there is an effect of in such a crisis there is an effect of being there there is such a thing about people being able to ask you question even the silly ones or even the small ones because they're looking for guidance they're looking for some sort of certainty um and <laughs> whether you like it or not yeah. in the realm of your own business yeah. you're it you're yeah. it right even though they're asking you question that often you don't have the answer or it's it's you know it's based on government recommendations or things like this but they need yeah. there there's a need it's really fascinating for me there's a need for reassurance through authority it's a bit like when you're a kid you go ask your dad or you do ask your mom all right you, you need that certainty or do you need at least feeling like someone's got the answers <laughs> so yeah. that's part of the equation of it It is part of the equation. I want us to kind of go into this crescendo where we go back to that. Yes. Um, but sure thing. let's start from the beginning in terms of yep. your career and how you ended up in Australia. I'd love to know. Yes. Uh, your LinkedIn only shows Australian jobs. I can see yes. you did your education in France. Correct. What brought you to Australia? So... I've always been um, interested. So I, I'm a food tech, right? So by training, um, I did uh, my studies as a food technologist uh, and 
I was lucky enough that straight after uh, military service, which was mandatory at the time in France, um, I was hired in Nestle. Uh, and Nestle being an international company, and at the time, and I think it still is, the number one in food, um, I was uh, hired into a research and development job. And so straight away, you are thrown into the world because Nestle is a global company, has always been, you know, because they started in the 19th century. And um, the reason they're number one is because the first thing they did was to go internationally. Mm. It's fas- it was fascinating to me to see that uh, they were, you know, they were actually in Australia at the start of the 20th century, right? So it's, it's those kind of companies that always thought, you know, there is a, there is a, a big wide world to explore. Um, but also very early in that career, what I got out of Nestle is this interest in carrying or taking the, the best out of every part of the organization or every part of the world. So uh, it's, it's quite interesting for me that uh, it's one of the few companies I've worked with that's been able to do that at a global scale is taking really not just their stuff and spreading it out to the world, but actually learning from the world and bring it back in and then disseminating the best of the world. So that's, that's something that I think when I think back, it's probably molded my thinking mm-hmm. in terms of um, looking first at um, your environment and what you can learn from it uh, and how you can take the best and build that back in uh, into what you, what you do. So, I was lucky enough to do that very early. And um, interestingly then is uh, at the time Nestle decided they were going to be number one in ice cream um, from a very, very small base. The only business they actually... I love those kinds of key strategies. You know? it just sounds <laughs> Let's so just be number one. Let's just you know? be number one in ice cream. Yeah. Right. Cool. And I was lucky enough that the only real big business they had at the time when they decided that was in France. Um, and I was right there. So... What happened then is they started to buy businesses in every single country they could find one. Um, And so I became part of the journey because I was there, I was in R&D, they needed people to go into this acquired business to learn what was there to learn as well as to be um, basically introducing Nestle to these new businesses. And so I ended up in the Philippines as an expat which was really the start of my uh, international career with Nestle. And that gave me two things. It uh, allowed me to actually uh, develop every muscle of uh, what that you need for running a business, which was kind of what was in it for me, Mm -hmm. because essentially they uh, allowed me to be in every part of the business um, as my career developed. So they kept on letting me change job really. Um, and uh, what was in it for them is they could just move me anywhere they needed me. And so eventually that landed me in Australia, um, in uh, Peter's Ice Cream in Mulgrave, actually, mm-hmm. um, where I was the factory manager, after which I was the marketing manager, director, and after that I was the uh, uh, sales or business sales director. So that's been the funny part, if you want, but I, that's probably uh, at the end of a 15 years career with Nestle. And um Eventually, this is where I chose Australia over Nestle because oh. uh, it was time to move on again. And I think uh, by then I thought, you know what? I really like it here. This is really my, the country I feel the most aligned with um, and the environment I feel the most aligned with. So I jumped off Nestle and uh, stayed in Australia. And okay. that's, that's really how I got there. Is, um, you know, what was it about a journey. Australia? It's very different from France. What was it about Australia that made you want to stay? Uh, I think, I think first it's uh, it's probably the the one country I can think of. Although I could probably put New Zealand, New Zealand in that basket as well. Is it's one that the one country where you feel the need to be part of the overall community. So many many countries. That's it's in a, in many ways. That's always been the French dream is to have a seamless. Um, assimilation into the, you know, to the French spirit or the community. And I think Australia does it without, does it without really, really thinking about it. When you're in Australia, you want to be an Australian first, but you're still who you are and that's okay, right? Um, France was built on the same idea, but it doesn't quite work. 
um, if that makes sense, right? People are more and more, more like the American model where they want to be who they are first and then French second. So whereas in Australia, what really, really I loved it is it was effortless, effortless to be part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, it was relatively simple as an ID and, and a set of value and, I felt very, very comfortable with that. Um, and then the living conditions are fantastic in Australia. You know, you've got space, you've got access to services um, very easily. So uh, the only thing I, I missed at the time, which I don't anymore, um, because Australia has come such a long way, was food. Um, because, I thought you, know, you were going to say wine. <laughs> yeah, true, true, that too. But, you know, I've adapted as well. Now it's really hard actually to... Uh, <laughs> To consider French wine as much better than Australians because it's not quite uh, not quite that. Uh, this is what I like, and you know, it's it kind of transition with Coco Black as well. Is that Australia has this knack um, of doing what I would call new world to uh, to food. Yeah. So it's like it it respects the tradition of that food. You know, take wine as an example, or coffee these days, or mm-hmm. chocolate with Coco Black. It respects what it is about what has been done for centuries sometimes with that product, mm-hmm. but it does it it's in, in its own way. It, and that's a new world way, a very contemporary way to say, yeah, that part's critical to getting the product right, yeah. but everything else is just tradition and we can do it our own way because we don't have traditions. We're only a, you know, 150 years old, so we need to create our own. And so they've done that so successfully with wine. Yeah. Melbourne's done that to coffee. There is such a thing as an Australian coffee, really. Absolutely. And uh, Coco Black intends and has started doing that for chocolate. Well, I'm Brazilian, as you know. Yes. And I've always thought before moving to Australia that I knew a lot about coffee. But Melbournians in particular are yeah. obsessed with, with coffee. They are. To the point that I sometimes have taken notes and sent it back to my brother-in-law who... who has a coffee farm and roasts coffee in Brazil and say, look, this is what they're doing in Australia now. I felt like, you know, they were a step behind. And I know that Fleur from Market Lane flies back to Brazil a lot to kind of ask the farmers and the roasters to do what she wants them to do for her coffee to be sold here at Market Lane, which is, you know, a really uh, high yep. quality coffee, a um, uh, couple of locations in Melbourne. It's mm. amazing. And my oldest son has, tro- well, he, he has lived in San Francisco, spent some time in New York and London and hated the food there. <laughs> <laughs> because he, he, you know, the coffee, the waking up in the morning, he lives in Richmond, waking up in the morning in Richmond, Melbourne and having a coffee, even in lockdown, you know, you cannot take that away from no. Melbournians. no. <laughs> and in the coffee in those locations very rarely you find now you a have blue one, bottle yes. in, in san, Fran- san francisco has blue bottle which is you know okay like it's like a, a normal <laughs> melbourne coffee but not one that you would find right outside his richmond flat you know yeah it's, it's yeah. amazing yeah. yeah you're right you're right so you know and You've been in Italy probably or France or these kind of countries. It's part of the culture, right? So, but this is what I like is they've adopted the parts of that that uh, make those, uh, those categories or those products what they are. But they, there's clearly, clearly an Australian touch to it because, yeah. you know, it's just not the same. And, um, you know, as a wine drinker, to your point is I came in thinking, you know, French wines this way, way above the rest. And now, you know, there's some types of wine that um, I'd actually only have the Australian version. I wouldn't have the French version. Yeah. So you just, you know, you, you just have this kind of mix of modern and tradition, which is quite unique to, um, to this country. Um, and and that, the experiences that really of, you know, going to, I mean, we live, we're very lucky. We're just outside some beautiful wine regions where, you know, Without the uh-huh. lockdown, you can go to cellar doors and in every big city. If, you, if you're in Sydney, you go to the Newcastle region. If you are in Adelaide, you go to Barroso, McLaren. So there's always a great wine That's region true. to visit. Yeah, it's awesome. So well done for choosing um, Australia. But I'm, and I followed your career, some of it. We've worked together, together. Um, yep. um, at Monash. Um, I... I 
um, we'll talk about it in the introduction and, you know, in the sort of success that you've had um, managing different types of food businesses in Australia. And now um, you find yourself in this unusual situation, um, like many other CEOs, running a business uh, under COVID. And you wrote an open letter to CEOs um, which was very um, beautifully written and showing that vulnerability that we want to see in our leaders these days. What was your intention when you did that? What made you decide it's, I just need to put it I out? I just need to get world. it out, right? So um, it was interesting because it was after f the first wave or towards the back end of that first wave. Mm -hmm. And... Um, during that first wave, you, you know, it was a real crisis management, right? The second wave is very different, but the first wave was really crisis. Um, and you know, I've been fortunate or unfortunate to have been through these exercises before, but never to the scale that COVID has brought on. So I wasn't, you know, out of my depth. We were working that quite hard. Um, but I suspect, you know, part of my thinking during the process was, you know, leadership's always uh, a really a lonely job to a degree, right? You, you, do, you do obviously uh, work with your teams and you do have, if you're lucky enough, have enough, you know, connections with them that it's not quite uh, a solitary job, but it is lonely because ultimately a lot of the decision making is, um, uh, has to be done with you. And I think... COVID because everybody around you, not just your business, but every single person, every single part of society, every other business was also in the same situation. You couldn't lean on anybody. You really couldn't. You were, everybody was in crisis mode. And that's probably one of the few times where, you know, often when you're in a crisis, you still can call someone, you can still talk, you can work it out. But there, there was just either no time or no no space because everybody was in the same boat and they had their own problems and you couldn't just, you know, do any of that. So it felt extremely lonely towards the end of this. And what struck me really at the time was that when we started to come out of that period, um, there was a lot of noise, a lot of things that were starting to come back um, through various parts of the uh, of the market of people starting to say, oh, why did you, why did they do this? What did they do that? And it really struck me at the time that, you know, and it was not directed at me or Coco Black, right? I'm just talking about um, in particular, you know, leadership or government and people like this that were starting to be judged on their actions. And I really felt the need to say, hey, you know, we, one, we've all been in this. So there's been a lot of decisions made by people who really just did the best they could and literally did the best they could. And I actually put myself into their shoes because probably in a non, in a crisis that wouldn't be as universal as that one, I probably would have been one of those that would have said, hey, why did they do this? Mm. You know, and second guess these guys. And so I felt really compelled this time to say, um, don't judge your leaders like that right now. They've certainly done the best they could. Um, and I could um, really, I could see that um, within my organization, I was lucky enough that most of the guys actually just, you know, verbalized that they were appreciative rather than critical. Uh, I saw that I, in the comments. A lot yeah, and so I was really keen on trying to get that out of others for their own leaders because I felt that's the only thing that really mattered is not so much what was the outcome because you know we could have as coco black we could very well have been shut down permanently mm -hmm. after easter because if you recall uh the whole lockdown occurred 10 days out of easter which is probably the worst time ever you can think to have a problem for a retail based chocolate business right mm -hmm. um and so you know, we could very well, I've just had, uh, uh, you know, the, the hardest of time and finished closed down. So that wasn't the case, but that could have happened. Um, but it didn't come through what people were um, telling me. And I thought, this feels really good of saying that you haven't been judged just on the outcome, but you have been judged on what you did, how you did it, 
uh, how present or not present you were. And I think there was a lot of leaders who didn't know, uh, made potentially bad choices, but they did it in a way that was what mattered the most. And uh, so I wanted the opportunity to say, well, just, you know, come out and say it. And if no one else does, I'm saying it to you. I know what you did. I know how hard it's been. Don't judge yourself just on the results. Just judge yourself on the fact that you were there um, and you made the decision when it mattered because there's nothing worse than not making decisions in times of crisis. So that's probably what motivated me is just saying, I want to share a piece of that, um, you know, that, um, that thank you that I did receive myself. Um, yeah. So, um, and I knew because that's not our, traditional nature right to go back and say oh thank you but uh in the in the hindsight piece that always comes after something like this there's always going to be clever people who have 20 20 insights and who will say oh we should have done this you should have done that but weren't there in the moment no it's the man in the arena uh speech. spot on you had a great yeah. quote on that yeah that's exactly yeah. what it felt like yes yeah. <laughs> uh i i related to that a lot you know and and of course i have i i'm not in a position of leadership at the moment i'm just you know very you've been right comfortably in my house but having been in um crisis situations before as well um even even when you can rely on others so for example when i was the ceo of the john monash foundation we had over a hundred scholars spread out across Europe during the terrorist attacks in London, in Nice, in Brussels, in, in Paris. There was no um, manual for dealing with that. There was no. no, you know, should we bring them all home? You know, and my responsibility to, to those lives, to their families, to my board, to the donors and the Australian government and the state government, everybody that put money towards you know, um, uh, that prestigious scholarship program that allow these uh, people to go overseas and study, but now they're in danger. What do we do? You know, how much do I panic? You know, what's the degree of panicking? And I, I tend to thrive under pressure. <laughs> you know, I'm very calm, you know, but inside it eats me up, right? So don't let me I don't let people see it, but, but inside, yeah, I'm like, yeah it's, it's okay. taxing. It's, it's very taxing. taxing. And I, I, I think that was probably the worst. Well, you know, I had a business in Brazil. I think it can't be worse. <laughs> that can, anything that you try to do in Brazil is also very taxing on your hormone levels and your stress because you're dealing with corruption, with crime. You know, you don't, you don't ever know who to trust. There is no guidebook. You can't trust anybody really. That's right. You know, you can't go to the authority. In Brazil, we don't go to the authorities. To <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't be saying that on my podcast, but that's the truth, you know? Yeah. yeah. And um, so I, I get you, I got you straight away and I wanted to talk to you because this is the time where um, we are going to be um, assessing the type of leaders to lead organizations into the future. And you're having this um, opportunity not only to run business during the crisis, but you've been reflecting upon it as mm. well and, mm. and posting it for others to see. How do you see now that we are in the second wave What's mm. different in the second wave? Are it's very different because it is still obviously some sort of a crisis, but it's a slow one. So when in the first wave it came so fast, mm. so quickly, um, and it was so thorough that you were in a real, real crisis management situation, you know, so it's almost like your factory is just blown up type situation. Mm. So you really had to be decisive, um, uh, for all at the time we had no safety nets you know if you cast yourself back there was no such thing as job keeper or, or job seeker etc so your your first things went into your that went into your mind was obviously business survival but also your people's well-being because you know and this is this this was the hardest part in the first piece is not to jump the gun 
yeah. even though you were in the middle of a really, really bad crisis. And, uh, you know, I saw companies who went straight away as potentially you should if you were just thinking about the business and just stood down people, closed things down, you know, just for cash, 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 that's all you had to do. But if you do that, you're essentially just thinking about the business. That's it. You're not thinking about the people inside the business. So we, we had to trade that very fine line about doing the right thing for the business survival, but also to keep your people through it. Um, I know eventually you're, you, we were taking a risk on, you know, losing it all because, you know, we didn't know. So we were fortunate enough that then relatively quickly after that, the government put JobKeeper in place, uh, which started to give us actually time to think things through. Um, this time around, what's actually more interesting is first thing, there is no doubt there is a general wariness in people. And it's not just us, you know, it's everybody inside, outside the business because it's been going on now for five months and there is no real end in sight, right? We were finally starting to come back out of it, you know, towards the back end of June, there was a, you know, a flicker of thinking, oh, we're, we can see, you know, we can see we're not too far off our normal life and then bang, comes the second wave. So there is definitely a, a, an extra effort at the moment to try and keep people um, not motivated. That's not, that's probably not what, what I'm thinking, but probably have enough energy to continue and to go on. So enough resilience. You're really probably a, a now in a time of resilience rather than a time of crisis, really. That's, and I think slowly but surely, as a leader, you probably pick that up earlier than the others often, but you can see it's going to last a long time now, you know? Uh, at one point, you're like everybody, you hope it was a two or three months bad time and then slowly but surely you're getting back on. Now, I think that that has passed. Now we're in a long haul. It's going to take, you know, six to 12 months of good hard whole slog to actually get out of this. So I think what's happening now is not only you've got to try and help people realize that gently, you know, because you don't want to, them to be despair, despair, or yeah, in despair, you want them to still hope and feel and want to, you know, achieve. Um, but you have to slowly get them to the realization that we're going to have to be resilient. It's now, you know, we're in a drought. We're going to have to tighten the valves, right? So, um, and then it, what really happens next really for, for most businesses is you've really got to look at your, business and your people with that in mind and thinking, actually, I can't just tough this out. I, I just can't. I have to go back to my business model. I have to change. I have to do things because what if it stays like this for three, four years? I can't hope that my business comes back to normal. I have to change it to the new normal. And what is that? And so it it's an, it's the next phase next evolution and you need to probably do that um with your teams you need to figure it out with them is what if it's going to be like that for 6 to 12 months what do we have to do different because what we know is you know uh, as much as the government's been quite generous at some point it won't work and you can't run a business on subsidies it just doesn't work right mm -hmm. so we're going to have to, and obviously if the first phase forced us to do a number of these things, you know, the famous pivot word that everybody uses is we've pivoted. Yeah, we do it. We did. Um, we did do business uh, however we had to do business. Mm -hmm. But it's the same thing. When it's a crisis, you do things that are not sustainable, but you do them by sheer force of will. And, you know, this is where being with your teams is important because you're asking them to do something that is going to require force of will. Yeah. Um, but then now in this phase, it's not that anymore. Now it's got to go beyond that. It's got to go about how do I make this sustainable? What do I have to change so that it's become the new normal? Um, and so it's probably a far more, um, it's a different emotional ride now because, you know, it's not the rush that, you you may have felt in the first wave it's this you know this because of re the resilience nature of this piece it's actually making sure you also keep yourself steady yeah. 
because what you can't afford is the high at lows. In a crisis, you can. You know, you can have the super highs and then the next day you can be crying in your corner. That's okay. That's all fine because you pick yourself up and you come back and you go back in. That's not the case here. Here it's really steady, steady, steady because it's a long game. And so it's really different. Uh, it feels different. It's, I think it actually feels almost far more vulnerable than the first time around. <laughs> Because you are in the long game. Everybody's feeling it. You know, I can see it from the clients that I have because I do, I'm doing career coaching now. So I, I'm dealing with clients uh, who are less uh, motivated now than they were before. Both yeah. the ones that are currently employed and the ones that are at home. Um, but also the overall energy you know, in the community and yeah. the corporate world, you know, it's, it's, emails tougher, like right? that. Yes. it's getting tougher and it's harder even to keep, um, my husband has been working from home most of his career. Um, and he, he's always telling me this is not working from, this is not what working from home looks like. This is, this is not working from home. He's actually more annoyed and impatient than I am. <laughs> because his routine has been disrupted and he's yes. the one that has always worked from home whereas I'm the one that's always out and about going um, into the office and so on so for him it's been really tough because he can't have those timeouts and and coffees and work from a different workspace all of those things that add um, a diversion and boost creativity and can add a little bit of social interaction that then gives the work energy and momentum and a, a cadence for people that work from home. If you add that kids and you know, your partner also at home or your housemates and all of that, it's just the combination is too it's crazy. Too yes. Difficult. Yes, it is. How much mental well being is being part of, uh, your leadership and, and what you need to manage in the workplace? Um, it's actually a very good question. It's, it, it depends on the individuals, but it's also probably something that's even more important to watch in the ones that don't seem to need it, right? Because, you know, and you've got to definitely be quite acutely aware of what's going on in, in your teams. And this is where I find working from home with your teams is a bit tricky because you don't get a lot of the signals that as a leader you rely on, right? So I'm, you know, being French, I'm a very tactile leader or I'm a very physical in the sense that I come, I go see people, I walk the floor, I go see in the factory, I go in the stores and so on. And right now I can't really do that too much. Um, and if I do it, I have to have a mask and everything. So obviously it's not quite the same. So you don't have all the signals that you learn over the years of saying, mm, that person's not doing too well or, or that person's angry or that, you know, you don't see that. Um, and so you've really got to be a, a lot more proactive. So it's even more demanding in terms of your leader's time. But I, I actually always thought that this is one of your top responsibilities, actually be in touch. And then you see, you get a judgment fairly quickly. Yeah, it feels like that person's in a good period. Just, you know, just coaching moments rather than too much involvement versus mm, that person's in a hole. I need to try and work out how I get them out. Um, or that person needs a kick. Sometimes it's what it takes as well, right? Sometimes it's about, hey, shake yourself. You know, you, you're not alone around here, right? So, uh, um, but I think, yeah, it's a big part because... Ultimately, what's interesting is there's a lot to do, but potentially not as much as before. There's a lot of smaller stuff that you deal with because business is slow in certain parts. Mm -hmm. So you need to replace your focus away from your business task list to a little bit on a people list and spend some of that time more trying to keep the energy flowing mm -hmm. and dealing with people who have real issues as opposed to spending all your time just really working the business. So mm. it, it is a shift, certainly. Um, and I think the longer this lasts, the more for, that happens. Sorry to interrupt. It's a oh, shift no. also for those who are not in 
CEO positions True. you want to be. So that's another interesting discussion for us to have because you've been in uh, leadership, CEO type leadership roles and, and director type roles. That's how we met. And then back into the CEO roles. What has been different between them mm. that you can um, explain to someone who has not yet been a CEO but aspires to be? Yes. Because that's the, the, the sort of um, clientele that I have at times. Yep. People that are yep. really keen to go up at the next, the next level and they haven't been there yet. Look, I think the main thing to get ready for in that space is a lot of the mechanics you've been as a department leader or, or a manager. Um, if you do these well with your teams and your peers, you're probably able um, to replicate them at a high level. I think the big difference in a CEO position is, um, is the famous, the buck stop with you. And I think it's getting to grips that no one else no one else is actually going to tell you you need to go and do this no one else is going to show you that maybe there's a, an opportunity over there or, or push you or give you a deadline you've got to be you've got to become self-disciplined around these points you've got to start to think about what are my mechanics so that i don't forget because we all forget right we get busy uh, or we're having a bad day and, and you know, you don't check in with your people as you should, et cetera, et cetera. So you got to build yourself some fail safe. You've got to build yourself some routines. You've got to build yourself some mechanics to remember what you probably know anyway, what you've probably practiced, except that when you're the CEO, there's no one telling you, hey, today you should go and check with X, Y, Z. Um, which sometimes, you know, a good, you know, good leaders you've worked with, you've learned from them, but often what you miss is that that's what they do for you mm -hmm. is they remind you, they give you a nudge, they give you a prop, they give you a kick, you know, they're the ones who've actually helped you perform or achieve or be a good leader yourself. It's because they were there to be the person that were almost your conscience, right? And just saying, and you know, you can tell the good ones from the bad ones in your memory as well. You could think about leaders which were so task oriented that they actually didn't help you being a good leader. Mm -hmm. Probably they made you a worse leader for it, right? So, so you can tell the difference, but I think it's about stepping back and remembering, oh, oh okay, so that's why he was doing this. That's why he was asking me, mm -hmm. you know, about that person or this person. He wasn't, for micromanagement or whatever, it was actually triggering me to action because he could see that maybe I had forgotten or maybe I hadn't done it or, you know, and it was not a judgment. It was actually helping me remind myself that that's part of the job. Mm -hmm. So I think as a CEO, but the difference between not being a CEO and being a CEO is that's probably the fundamental one I can see is that you're at the start mm -hmm. and the end or of everything. And you need to build yourself some ways um, that you remember remember that um, all the time. So in a, in normal times, obviously, the business rhythm carries you a lot with that. And it's a lot easier. In those time, it's not. Because in those time, you really have to be on the front foot all the time. So it's exhausting, by the way. And it should be. Um, because, you know, I, guess I had a boss one time. We rem I remember in the days. And he said to me, You'll know if you're managing well, if you end your day exhausted and you start your day with full of energy. If you, if you haven't done you know, that by meeting your people and passing on your energy, you haven't done your job. And that's, that one stuck with me for a long time, thinking, yeah, I think he's right. You know, yeah. he's right. Good. That's a good, that's a good analogy. It's like, you're like a battery. You just kind of pretty much. That's exactly right. So you have to find ways to replenish too. That's the other learning is that, um, you know, if you don't find ways to reload yourself and that's another thing, not everyone knows what they need to do, you know, on their me time to actually bring that energy back because what you can't do is constantly go at it and draw on your own energy because eventually this is where you can't, you can't sustain it. Um, and so you have to have, you know, and it's different for anybody, for everybody about what, you know, what switches you're on, what, what gives you energy. And it 
doesn't have to be in the business, of course. It can act generally it's outside of business. So when you get in, you are full of energy or as full of energy as possible. So, but yeah, you don't want the battery to be depleted and then you have nothing to give. Nick, let's imagine this sliding door moment where you were not the CEO of Coco Black in 2020 mm. and you were a director in another organization and you were made redundant. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, yeah, we... There's a few of those, yeah. We have both been in this situation as Correct. well where you are in that sandwich level where it's easy to get rid of you because you're on short-term contracts, usually three-year contracts, and you know the projects you're running are probably going to lose their budgets anyway, and it's better to just, you know, um, yep. cut it. Cut it. Yes. And there are lots of people like that, you know, yep. senior, high-quality, experienced, seasoned professionals who are now out of work all around the world. What would you do if you were one of them uh, what would I do? What would be your strategy as a job yeah. hunter in this time? In this market? Well, the first thing probably is just take a moment to ensure that you don't blame yourself for the situation. Um, so just, you know, use the fact that you are, a pro you know, an experienced professional and you can see that, you know, you potentially, if you had been on the other side, would have done something similar. Right. So the first thing is just deal with it, you know, grieve it and then move on. You've got to recognize why it was done. It's not personal. It's not about you. It's not about your skills. It's not about your experience level. It's about a situation. And if you were in the same situation as a business leader, you probably would have done the same. So um, this way you can put it in behind you and move on. Because often people I find who have been in those situations and go for jobs have a chip on their shoulder and it's really hard for them. They feel the need to prove that uh, it wasn't their fault or, you know. And so I, I think it's really important that you move away because otherwise you can't look at new jobs um, with fresh eyes or what you actually can and can't do. Um, so that's the first thing. Then you go back to what are my strengths, you know? Uh, it's like people development is the same. You have to focus on their strengths, not their weaknesses. So it's about building on the strengths. So I think if you go job hunt, first thing is where, what am I really good at? And then if you're lucky, what, I do, what do I like? And can I find a job that intersects the two, right? So, but first things first is what am I good at? Um, and then at the moment, it's really looking at the market in a new light. It's looking at the fact that um, right now, if you're looking for a job, you are going to potentially have to change sector. You're going to have to look at sectors who are probably thriving under this particular, um, you know, light uh, and will be recruiting uh, and will be looking for experienced people. Then it's about how do you build your story and your case based on your strengths and what you could add to that sector. You know, once upon a time when I left Nestle, I felt extremely vulnerable mm -hmm. because I had done all my career in one company across the world. I knew everybody. I knew who to ask, where to go, and it felt like my second family. And all of a sudden, I was out on the market and I had no clue who I was from a professional point of view because I was defined by being a Nestle manager. And so I had to relearn what I was good at. Um, and I ended up working for Godfrey's Vacuum Cleaner. Now, so it's not a straightforward jump from thinking you, you were marketing of Peter's ice cream and the next day you're, uh, you know, you purchase. I was buyers. I was buying manager for Godfrey's. So I was buying vacuum cleaners in China. So, you know, and... And the, the, the reality is the, the great part of that experience. you do for Australia, hey? Correct. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, but you know what that really taught me is to believe in my skills. Yeah. Because the only thing I had to sell uh, was what I was good at. And eventually I, I got the confidence that you can put me in any situation, any job, any company, any sector, uh, make it work. Why? Because 80% of the equation is almost the same. 
It's about getting the best out of the people who work for you. It's about understanding, you know, the business model. And it's about looking for value. And that's that, right? So it doesn't matter in your vacuum cleaner, if you're in digital communication or if in your chocolate manufacturing, it's the same. So you got to be able to put yourself in that and say, this is what I'm good at. This is where I'm going to be. And it doesn't matter what the rest of the equation is. I can do this. But, you know, it's easy said. It's not easy done. So there's, there's a lot of self work on that because generally when you have lost a job and you're looking for another job, you look for the same. And in this market, it's not going to work or you're going to be extremely lucky, which, which is possible, by the way, you know, of course, um, to find the exact same job. So you're yeah. going to have to put yourself in a situation where you're saying, here are the three, four things I can bring to any companies. Where do I see that they can potentially need that? And where are sector thriving? And how can I convince them that I can be part of that? Because I'm very good at these four things. Okay. So that'd be my advice. Great one. Any last thoughts you want to share? Um, look, um, I think uh, really right now it's it's interesting in the back of my mind. It's been about thinking about how do I spend time every day to remind myself that it's going to be, as I said, a long haul mm. and therefore I need to take my emotions down and accept that it's going to be a long haul and uh you know and as a business leader you're always impatient right you always want to get better you always want more sales you always want this but right now is not the time to be like that yeah. there are times where you can be more driven more demanding it's not the time and so whilst it's going to make it tougher because Essentially, you know, if sales don't come, etc. Yes, you're gonna have pressures, etc. But I don't think it's the time to be like that. It's the time to be patient. It's the time to be a coach. It's the time to develop, and it's the time to accept that if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Right. But what you can't do is trade that for being an impatient, driven, annoying person the whole way through, because that's actually not gonna make anything better. So. <laughs> it's going to take more self-discipline. That's probably my parting words is because that's something I'm grappling with, you know, through this is thinking I really need to accept that. Yeah. Well done. Well, congratulations on everything that you're doing, not just for the company, but, you know, in the thought leadership you're sharing. That's fantastic, Nick. So great to talk to you. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Renata. It's great that you're doing this, you know. Uh, it's great that I hope you're enjoying doing that too. I am. <laughs> I hope you found this episode useful and that it helps your job hunting and career plans. Don't forget to subscribe and follow me on social media and on your favorite podcast app. And please join the Reset Your Career community so I can send you free tools and resources to make your career advancement more successful. See you next time!